check, 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 mic, check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. All right. Well, good evening. You all got quiet on me. That's okay. Uh, let's pray, and then uh, we'll dive in. No notes tonight, so if you're looking for them, you don't need to, and uh, we'll go for it. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, thank you for tonight, and Lord, thank you uh, just that in every single moment, Lord, uh, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs, and so we pour out our praise. Father, uh, as we come to your word tonight, Lord, we need you. We need you to move. We need your spirit in us. We need you to uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, always our desire isn't just to, to learn information, but it truly is to come to you to seek, uh, Lord, your will, your purposes, your heart, your life. And so, Father, I pray tonight that as we come to you, uh, Lord, that you'll meet us here. And Lord, I love it because I, I really believe you do. But Lord, I, I pray that you will, uh, maybe even in a special way tonight. We love you, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, a couple of reflections as we kind of start tonight. Uh, one thing that we need to kind of wrap up from last time, or at least bring up again, and, and, and it will relate to tonight as well to some degree. And then another is just kind of a general observation. First general observation is, you know, I was, I was thinking that as we went through First Peter, uh, I did not anticipate it taking this long at all. Uh, which is okay. I kind of thought, hey, it'll take us maybe, you know, seven, eight weeks, something like that. Uh, but we've really kind of downshifted, right, in the speed. And it's honestly because there's a lot of really sort of rocky, tumultuous, uh, debatable things. So we've tried to take our time to do that. But I wanted to take this point when we're kind of rounding the bend, kind of third corner, making our way kind of toward the end. It is interesting from just the standpoint of studying the Bible, uh, that you can do it in many different ways, but you remember the, the night when basically I was like, hey, let's look at some major themes of the book as a whole, but let's do it in one big chunk. Let's read the whole thing. And I, I do think, and I, I think there was some good feedback, that there was some value to that in terms of instead of like chopping it up into just phrases or sentences, okay, what's the big picture? Um, I love that. I also think there's some value in doing what we're doing and saying, okay, let's go pedal to the metal 100 miles an hour all the way through, and now let's go like inch by inch, like you're going on the slow steamroller, okay, and covering the exact same ground. Both are legitimate, but what I wanted to just bring up is it is very different, right? And I'll just tell you, this is what I like to do. When, when we go through studies, I like to start out like I did with like big picture, what's the major theme? Okay, we have Christ as the model, we have suffering as our path, and, and, and we're new, new believers in Christ, and therefore we should endure suffering and fix our eyes on Jesus. Okay, big picture. Uh, but I also like, after having gone through something, and this is probably what we'll do when we get to the end. I love doing it fast. I love slowing it down. But then really, when you, when you want to know what you've learned and how you've grown in your understanding, the best thing to do at the end is to come back and do exactly what you did at the beginning. But then hopefully, as you go through it again, there will be things that kind of pop up in your mind where it's like, okay, yeah, we're, we're reading through it. But I remember, I remember some of the things we talked about as we went through. And then that way you can almost gauge, wow, we went through fast, we went through slow, I learned a lot, and here's kind of what I learned. So I just wanted to point that out. We're going through slow, but eventually we're going to come back. We'll probably go through it fast again. Probably on the last night, I'm going to read through the whole book again. And just give us all a chance to say, okay, well, what has God shown us? And at least for me, as, as someone who I, I love studying the Bible, I love learning, that's one of the most helpful things is then to go back and see what you've learned. All right, uh, so there's multiple ways to study the Bible. That's one thing I want to say. The second thing is, uh, you know, last week we kind of dipped our toe at the end looking at kind of various interpretations of what it means that Jesus went and, you know, declared to the spirits who were imprisoned. And we talked about sort of the supernatural realm and its relevance to our lives. And actually, we, we had uh, one brother who came up afterwards, and it's interesting because he had kind of a unique background in his own sort of upbringing. 
But we, we had a discussion that I, I figured might be helpful to kind of share. You know, he said, Tim, in light of what we've talked about, you know, the Bible talks about angels, the talk, Bible talks about demons, the Bible talks about the supernatural world. He said, you know, should I be like going through my house, like casting out demons kind of thing? He didn't say it exactly like that, but like what, what level of seriousness, like what level of like everyday attention should I give to this? And that's a very good question. It's a very practical question, right? Because if the Bible talks about the supernatural world as being real and that there are being powers in the heavens and spiritual enemies, and, and even Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and powers of darkness that kind of rule this age. So what, what degree of attention should we give to it in the everyday? I don't have, I don't have anything close to the perfect answer to that question. Uh, but I do, think, I do think there's two ditches to avoid, okay? So the first ditch to avoid is just ignoring it completely, right? And some people are kind of like, wow, angels, demons, supernatural, that stuff just sounds crazy, so I'm just going to just ignore it. Well, I mean, think about this. What is prayer if not basically stepping into the spiritual world and asking God to intervene? And sometimes we do that directly. I mean, just when we were praying a few minutes ago, it's like, God, the enemy's real. The enemy, the enemy is a tempter, a liar, or a murderer. God, please push back against the darkness and help us to overcome, right? That's an appropriate thing to do. But one ditch is to ignore it completely. I think another ditch, and this might not surprise you, right, is to basically become so obsessed with it that it becomes sort of everything. And here's what I'll say. Um, I'm someone who likes to study. I'm someone who likes to get in the weeds. That's fun. But there are people, and this is my opinion, feel free to disagree with this, this is not thus says the Lord, but there are some people who I would argue get kind of so obsessed with things that are good to study and maybe good to know, but are not central to the gospel or the mission. And what do I mean by that? You may remember last week we talked about, okay, the Nephilim, we talked about Genesis chapter 6, were there there, these angelic powers who procreated with women, rebelled against God, uh, and and kind of gave rise to a a lot of these, these very dark spiritual realities. Well, there are some people who genuinely believe that, and there are some very smart people, very godly people who believe that that was a major event that's had a lot of repercussions. But here's my point. If you become so obsessed with it, then you start reading the plain and obvious and and most meaningful things in light of the obscure. And I think there's a very real danger there. I think the best way to approach the scripture is let the clear things be clear, let the main things be the main things, and then let the other things fall into place. And we, we, those are important. And I want you to hear me say this, everything's important. But even Jesus said this, think about this. Even Jesus said to the Pharisees, He said to them, listen, you guys are hypocrites. You're whitewashed tombs. He says, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, is what he told them. Love, justice, mercy. And you do all the small things. He said, you tithe a tenth of your mill, your mill, your dill, mint, and cumin, right? These spices. He's like, you guys are so, so like tedious with your obedience. So you're like, all right. Here's my stock of broccoli. I'm going to chop it up. I'm going to take this tent and I'm going to make sure it gets to the storehouse, right? Make sure all of my herbs and spices in my garden, I tie the tent. But he says, you don't care about mercy. You don't care about justice. And Jesus says to them, listen, you have neglected what the whole thing is all about. And in your own mind, you've justified it by basically saying, well, we do these very tedious things. And here's my point, even Jesus does help us to see there are main things in the Bible, right? I mean, that's why Jesus, Paul, they come back and say, okay, what's the greatest commandment? If you love God and you love your neighbor, you can sum it all up right there. Paul does this with the law, right? With the fruit of the Spirit. How does he end it? He says, against such things there is no law. So, Coming back to the supernatural world, is it interesting? Is it super fascinating? Yes. But for some people, they really almost think, well, here's my secret knowledge that unlocks the key to understanding the whole Bible. And that's where I push back and I say, hey, I don't want to ignore this. I want to believe it's real. I want to respond. I want to pray knowing that the spiritual world is real and the powers of darkness do work against us. But I also don't want to act like that's the whole point. 
Um, now, uh, so anyway, I think that's enough said on that point. Fair enough. Any thoughts or questions before we get into chapter four on that? We'll talk about it. we'll talk about some of those things just a little bit more as we get into uh, verse five tonight. I think it is, but okay, fair enough. Then let's keep going. All right, chapter four. Therefore, Peter says, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. All right? So let's, let's pause right there and just look at these couple of verses. So again, one of the big themes that we've seen is that when it comes to the Christian life, Jesus is the model and suffering is the path. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, don't think that is an, is an anomaly. Don't think that somehow that when the fiery trials come on you that something unusual is happening. In fact, here's what he says, and notice this, notice, uh, let's think about this, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same understanding. Now think of that language, arm yourselves with the same understanding. Um, well, what does it mean to arm yourselves? Prepare yourself for what you know is coming, right? It's deer season, okay? I, anybody in the room killed a deer so far? Yes, only one? To Ashley, Ashley's probably killed multiple. She's probably got like the tally up, you know. Uh, no, just one, okay. Guess what? When you go hunting, you have to be prepared. You have to be armed. You have to mentally think about what's going to come. Therefore, you arm yourself. And here's what he says, arm yourself with this understanding. Some of your translations might say, arm yourselves with this same attitude. We have to prepare ourselves mentally to know that we are going to endure suffering as followers of Christ. And again, and, and, and this is where it, it becomes so practical. Some people think that when bad things happen, that's a sign of God's disfavor. Peter says, turn it upside down. Suffering is actually a sign of God's favor on your life if Jesus is truly our example. Now, what does Peter say? We've read it many times. He says, don't suffer for doing evil, but rather do what's righteous, and then if you suffer, you know that you have favor with God. But we are to arm ourselves mentally with that same understanding. And then he says this interesting thing, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. Now, what does that mean? This is actually really interesting, and, and it goes back uh, there, there's some, there's lots of theological considerations here, um, and, and I'll, I'll explain maybe a few. So in the early church, uh, and this was, by the way, probably apostolic period, which is the time right after Jesus, but really probably for the first uh, at least couple hundred years, there was uh, a veneration of people who had suffered or died for their faith, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, when someone was martyred or killed, or when someone suffered by receiving beatings or, or whippings or wounds or imprisonment or whatever, there was an honor that they received among the church uh, that really, in a sense, corresponded to the level of punishment that they had received. And it, just to put it another way, people looked at those who had suffered and said, man, you guys are super Christians, right? And, and, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. That, sound, that's, that wasn't what I meant to imply. They looked at them and said, you rightly deserve honor because you have suffered for the name of Christ. Paul, by the way, says this at the end of the book of Galatians. He says, let no one cause any more trouble for me because I bear in my body the marks of Christ. That's what he says. And so for many uh, in the early church and beyond, they looked at people who had received punishment, persecution, beating, sufferings, and martyrs, and they rightly honored them. At times, they even took that too far. Like they, they honored martyrs and it, and it became eventually almost a veneration system of worship where eventually that's kind of what gave rise to sort of praying to saints and, and, and kind of the whole system. Now, again, we can use the two-ditch analogy, right? When someone suffers for Christ, is it good to honor them for that? Yes. So you don't just act like it's nothing. But at the same time, can we honestly see too that worshiping humans or acting like they're somehow uh, special before God for that is also wrong? Why do I mention that? Well, what does he mean? What does it mean the one who suffered in the flesh has finished with sin? 
Some people read this to mean essentially that when you suffer for Christ or when you go through martyrdom, that that is like automatic forgiveness for all sins for that purpose. In fact, you can see how this, this theology, um, you, you can see the natural progression of this theology. What was, what was like during the Crusades, one of the incentives to be a crusader? Well, if you die as a martyr, you're automatically saved, right? Free ticket to heaven. Oh, and maybe some plunder and booty to, to, to take with you. You know, if you don't die, well, then you get the stuff. If you do die, then you get a free trip to heaven. Obviously, we think that's wrong, right? That, makes, that belittles grace. That takes it out of the realm of united to Christ by faith and receiving the benefits of that. But you can see where texts like these could be misinterpreted in that way. The one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. Well, what does it mean? Uh, it doesn't mean automatic forgiveness. It doesn't mean that if, if you're beaten for the name of Jesus that you're automatically, you know, perfect. But what it does, I think, imply is that suffering is a means of sanctification, right? Uh, TCCS, uh, every day, I ask the students a question of the day. I didn't see this. Uh, I saw Britta's parents. Britta's not here? Britta, Britta, okay, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Britta's in my class, so I, I think about, I was thinking about her as I said that. Juniors and seniors, it's super interesting. We have a question of the day. Um, I th our question of the day, we're going through Colossians right now. Our question of the day uh, yesterday in class was, what are the hardest lessons to learn? What are the hardest lessons to learn? And it was actually super interesting. I'm really proud, honestly, of our juniors and seniors. I love having discussions with them because they, are, they really are. They are thinking beings. They have real thoughts. They have real opinions. And if you can get them to talk, which sometimes I've struggled to do, but having a question of the day and then making everyone at least answer, that's a good way to do it. Uh, so, the, uh, you know, it was interesting because they said yesterday, okay, what are the hardest lessons to learn? Uh, pay, you know, lessons that involve patience and waiting, lessons that involve, this was interesting, one of the first things that was said, lessons that involve humility, you know, uh, when, you have to, when you have to come back and, and, and be humbled by something, uh, lessons that involve physical pain or doubt, right? Whenever, or lessons that involve, you know, hey, uh, I, I, I'm not really sure that I agree with this, but I feel like I'm in an environment where I have to kind of say that I am. These were some of their answers, right, of, of, of the hardest lessons to learn and why it's hard. And so we had a really good discussion, but one of the things that we said was, I, I don't have a whiteboard to do it up here, but I said, okay, you know, people ask the question theologically, why is there suffering in the world? And there actually is a really easy and somewhat logically compelling answer to that. And so I said, there's an easy and obvious answer, but it's not usually very satisfying. I said, here's the answer. And I wrote up on the whiteboard. I said, okay, let's think of all these virtues. Let's just think of classic virtues like courage or patience or perseverance. Uh, or we could even think of general virtues like kindness or goodness or whatever. And I said, here's the thing. Every one of these, honesty, whatever it is, Every one of these things that we want in our lives, we want to be courageous, we want to, be, uh, we want to have perseverance, we want to have honesty, we want to be kind. Every one of those, by definition, has to have a negative possibility in order to be true, right? In order to be courageous, there has to be the possibility of fear. In order for there to be endurance, there has to be pain to overcome. In order for there to be honesty, there has to be the temptation of a lie that you wouldn't tell the truth and there'd be some advantage. So we went through this and said, here's the logical answer to the problem of suffering and evil, is that if God wants to produce in us this thing, these good things, then there has to be the possibility and reality of failure in these bad things. So logically that makes sense, right? To be courageous, you have to have something that you could potentially be afraid of. To be virtuous, you have to have the possibility of failure. Therefore, there has to be suffering if you want endurance. There has to be doubt if you want faith. And listen, if you sit and think about it logically, okay, yes, I get it. For there to be good things, there has to be the possibility of bad things. If you want to oversimplify it, that's basically it. And if you want to talk about free will or whatever else, there's lots of things wrapped up in that. But here's my point. Logically, I can understand. Yes, to be courageous, I have to have the opportunity to be a coward. To be honest, I have to have the opportunity to lie. You get it. You get where I'm coming from. But here's the problem. Logically, that can make sense. But in experience, that's never satisfying, right? If you are the one who is suffering, 
if you are the one who's going through it, you're not sitting there thinking, hey, that sounds like a great answer. That makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. That creates a lot of faith in God. No, like literally, and this is, this is, this is Job, right? Job had all the right theology. But in the torment of all that he went through, he was just like, God, it's not that I don't understand intellectually. It's that I think this situation breaks the mold. I think this situation, you have gone too far. You've put me through too much. You've been unrighteous. God, I don't get it. We can know intellectually that there are answers to the questions, and yet in our experience be like, God, this is crazy. What does Peter say? Those who have suffered in the flesh have finished with sin. What I think he's saying is, there is a part of sanctification that can only happen through suffering. And why? Why do I think that's a, a good interpretation of this? Here's why. Because what does it say in verse 1? Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same understanding. If we are going to take Christ as our example, even Jesus, this is what the book of Hebrews says, even Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Now think of this. Some people have a hard time, hard time kind of conceptualizing that. Why? Because, uh, and actually what Hebrews says is even Jesus was perfected through suffering. Well, how could that be? Because wasn't Jesus always perfect? Yes. But we tend to think of perfection as sort of a static thing. Perfection is like a badge that we wear as opposed to perfection being something that we live out. Jesus perfectly obeyed God even in the midst of very difficult circumstances, including suffering, including heartache, including loss, including grief, including what does the book of Hebrews said? He has been tempted in every way as we have been tempted. But it was through the suffering that even Jesus was sanctified, and not sanctified in the sense of an unholy thing becoming holy, but in the sense of a refined thing being demonstrated to be perfect. Now, here's the difference. We do have unholy things in our lives that have to be sanctified, right? We have unholy things that need to be made holy. But the same thing, suffering for Jesus, I don't mean suffering for the sake of Jesus, Jesus suffering and us suffering is oftentimes the greatest means of sanctification that we have. Let me give you two examples. I think both of these are from C.S. Lewis, if, if my memory is going to serve me right. Um, when it comes to suffering and hard things, we almost tend to look at Jesus and be like, Jesus, you kind of get a pass with this. You're the son of God. You have the cheat code, right? It doesn't really count, you know? After all, think of temptation. This is the C.S. Lewis illustration that he gives that I think is very powerful. What do you mean Jesus was tempted in the same way? Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was perfect. Therefore, Jesus was innately holy. It was inherent in his nature. He couldn't possibly have sinned. What do you mean he was tempted? And here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, some people think because Jesus never sinned that he couldn't have been tempted. But he said, in reality, here's the illustration. He said, it's kind of like this. Imagine that you're walking headfirst into a strong wind. And as you're walking, imagine that the wind becomes so powerful that it blows you over and you fall. You can't withstand it. But you're walking with other people, and maybe they can go a little bit further. You fell, but they go a little bit further, but eventually the wind is so strong that they fall too. But imagine that there's one who can walk headlong into the wind and he walks further and the wind rages and it blows the maximum that it's going to and that person never falls. He said, has that person not experienced the wind because they didn't fall? No, here's what C.S. Lewis said. In reality, he said, Jesus has experienced temptation in a deeper way than any of us ever have. Not because he hasn't failed, or not because he has failed, but because he hasn't. He's experienced temptation. And think of this. That's also true of suffering. You know, Jason, Kevin, and I, uh, yesterday, the day before, I don't remember when it was, we were in his office, and, and, and uh, we, were, we were talking about the Lord's Supper. It was after we, we finished. And Jason, we were talking about the idea of God's wrath being on Jesus. Well, how is that possible? And how is it if God turned his face away from Jesus, that, that kind of causes some thorny theological issues, right? One, we believe in a triune God who has unified at all times, 
So how is it that the Father and Son, you know, some people describe that moment as a tremor in the Trinity. I think that's actually really bad. But how do we understand it? And some people will even say, well, in that moment, did Jesus like literally become sin? Did he in any way cease to become God whenever God placed the sins? Like when the father turned his face away, did he cease being the son? And, and what, what we talked about is, no, actually, it was in virtue of being God that Jesus was able to take and withstand the wrath of God. In other words, it was only because Jesus was truly divine that he was able to take the wrath of God on himself, and here's why. Because when it comes to our sin, our sin is not just, it's not just an itemized list that you pile all the sins together, and here's the giant pile of sins, here's the total sum. In other words, you can't put a number on sin. You can't say, well, the total sum of human sins is 1.25 trillion sins total. And that Jesus on the cross bore the weight of that 1.25 trillion, you know, some sin mass. No, that's not the way sin works. Sin is not quantitative, it's qualitative. And this is where I'm not going to go through the whole illustration. I've done it a bunch of times. If you haven't heard it yet, eventually you will. It's the illustration where I punch my grandma, right? The, it says in Psalm 90 that the anger of God, the wrath of God is as great, man, that's Sorry, I just realized I've not done that since my grandma passed away. Maybe now is when I should be doing it. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Psalm 90 says this, God's anger is as great as the fear that is his due. In other words, God's wrath corresponds to the level of his holiness. Sin is proportionately offensive to the holiness of God. Well, God is what? Infinitely holy. Therefore, if God is infinitely holy, that means sin is by its nature qualitatively an infinite offense. This is, by the way, why hell makes sense. Hell doesn't make sense because, because God is mean or unjust. Hell makes sense because any sin against God is an infinite offense that requires an infinite payment, an infinite punishment. Now, if you're following me, then you'll be able to see why it's necessary that Jesus is divine in order to fully absorb the wrath of God for us. Why? Because if the weight of sin, if the payment for sin, if the punishment for sin is truly an infinite punishment, if that's what sin really deserves because God is infinitely holy, then only someone who can take on himself an infinite weight will be able to bear it. Therefore, Jesus, as God, was the one, the only one, who could take the full wrath of God and truly experience it. Here's where I'm going. Here's where I'm getting at. You or I, like, and this is why hell is eternal as well. Because the reality is, we can never, this is why hell is not like somehow ever exhausted. It's not because God is somehow like, I'm just going to keep on pouring fuel on the fire. It's because our sin deserves an infinite punishment. But that's where Jesus took the infinite punishment, and the only way he could do that is because he was the Son of God. That's why it had to be him. That's why when he prayed in the garden, God, if there's any other way for this to happen, please take this cup from me. And the answer was no. There was no other way. There was no other person who could do it. Jesus, as man, representing man, went to the cross. Jesus, as God, took the infinite weight of the punishment that sin deserved. So, again, where is this coming from? Why is, what does this have to do with 1 Peter? Well, again, Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same understanding that when it comes to our sanctification, we can never offer ourselves as a, as a redeeming sacrifice. That's impossible. But it is often true that the greatest work of God in our own lives in terms of being sanctified comes through suffering. And therefore, Peter says, arm yourself with that understanding. Don't take suffering as a sign of God's disfavor. Rather, take it as a sign that God is removing sin in your life. And that's what, why he says, those who have suffered in the flesh are done with sin. It doesn't mean they're sinless. It doesn't mean they're martyrs. It doesn't mean you worship them. It simply means that God uses suffering in our lives to shape us and mold us. And here's what we know. This was the other C.S. Lewis quote, by the way. 
He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he yells through a megaphone at us with our, with our pain. Have you ever experienced that? That it's like when life's going good, usually that's the, the time of the least growth. But whenever you're pressed and you have nothing else to do but just throw yourself at the feet of God and say, God, I, I can't do this. This is the prayer we talked about a couple weeks ago. I think it was Hezekiah in Second Chronicles. Hezekiah is facing a battle, and here's what he says. He says, God, we have, we have no idea what to do, but our eyes are on you. It's those moments when God does incredible work. But of course, do any of us want to seek those moments? Of course not. But if we want to mature in our faith, and this is, this is what we talked about, like maturity really only comes through challenge. That's what we talked about in our class. Sanctification, purity, really only comes through hardship. Now again, we're humans, and we just got to be honest, sometimes that hardship is so overwhelming that it feels like it is going to destroy us. And how do we know? Because we read the Bible, right? God, it's too hard, Job says. Can't handle it. Sometimes it's, it's you know, Jonah, where it's because of some lie that we believe or something, that we feel like, God, why would you do this? But Humans are really good at getting stuff, uh, of thinking that suffering is somehow a punishment rather than, puni- than suffering being God's most effective tool for the formation of our souls. All right, let's, let's keep going. 4 verse 3. There's already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards." Okay, again, we face one of those fun texts where it's like, what on earth does it mean that the gospel is preached to the dead? We'll get there in a minute. Again, this is helpful. One of, the, one of the principles of Bible study is read that which is clear first, have an understanding of that, and then ter- interpret that which is more obscure in light of that which is clear. Let's look at what's clear. He's saying to these believers, he's like, all right, guys, verse 3, there's already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. He's comparing here life in the flesh Versus life following Christ. Paul usually usually uses the language of flesh versus spirit. Same idea. And he's essentially saying, okay, all of you at one point were not believers. You gave your life over to the things of the flesh. You gave your life over, and he gives the list, right? To unrestrained behavior, evil desireness, evil desires, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. You know, carousing, that's one of those words. It's like, I'd, I'd love to go around the room and have us all give our best definition of what carousing means. I'm not really even sure. You know, what's carousing? There's probably a technical definition. Sorry, this is where my brain goes when I read words. I'm like, that's weird. Carousing and lawless idolatry, okay? Notice, he's, he's giving a list, unrestrained behavior, doing whatever you want. He gives the list specifically, and he's saying, listen, this isn't who you are anymore. And do you remember going all the way back to chapter 1 when we said essentially what Peter is doing, kind of the, the, the governing metaphor, if you will, of First Peter is you've been born again. You have a new life in Christ. You are a chosen priesthood, a royal nation, a holy people called out of darkness to praise the one who brought you out of darkness. So, so Peter's saying you're no longer who you once were. Very similar to Paul. You're no longer who you once were. You've spent enough time wasting time on these things. But now, crucify your flesh, move on from your old way of life, and start living in newness. And what does he say? He says there in the next verse, these people are surprised that you don't join with them in the same flood of wild living. Now, just get that in your mind. The believers come out of their old way of life, and all their old friends, all their old associates, all of the old leaders, uh, everyone's like, well, why, why aren't you doing this stuff with us anymore? Well, because I've become a follower of Christ. Whoa, you mean that Christ that, like, you know, you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood? You mean like the Christ who, you know, we've heard his followers aren't really loyal to Caesar anymore. You know, you mean that Christ that tells you you can't do all these fun stuff? Like, we know this. This is still common in our culture. Why don't you do these things with us? Why don't you participate in all of this unrestrained behavior, they say? 
And so he says, they're surprised, but then notice this next, this next part of the verse because it's incredibly important. And they slander you. This was the trap that many early Christians were falling in, not intentionally, but this was the trap of, okay, Paul, people are noticing such a difference in our lives that they're actually starting to get worried about it. They're like, we're living so differently that they're actually starting to think, and remember all the things we talked about, they're starting to think we're subversive. We're star- they're starting to think we're radicals. And remember, Nero, he's got to find someone to blame for the fires, right? He's got to find some enemy. He's gotta, he looks at these Christians and say, you aren't willing to swear by our gods or pay homage to our gods? Well, guess what? When we lose a battle, whose fault is it? It's the Christians. They begin to slander us for our behavior, at which point, well, what do we do? And that's where the suffering as Christ suffered Arm yourselves with this mentality. Peter says, get used to it. It's going to happen. If you truly follow Christ, there are going to be some people who look at you and say, not only do we not get it, but actually you are dangerous. And think about this. It's not for naught that the Romans thought Christians were dangerous, right? I mean, isn't it true that eventually enough people in the Roman Empire became Christian? And what happened to the Roman Empire? Starts to crumble. And this is, this is, by the way, okay, who cares about the Roman Empire? This is, by the way, why even today there are countries and systems of government that fear Christianity to their core. Why? Because Christianity at its heart says, my fundamental loyalty is to Christ first. This is, for instance, why uh, in East Asia, right, the most populous nation in the world, the government has to control how many Christians there are, who can have churches, where they can be. Why? Because they're scared to death of a king who claims a higher and deeper loyalty than the state. This is why communist regimes uh, across the ages have hated Christianity, because Christianity is dangerous. And Peter says, listen, They might say things like, well, why aren't you participating? Why aren't you doing this? And they may slander you. But what does he say? They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. He's trying to remind uh, remind the believers, hey, whatever power they they wage, uh, whatever, whatever threats they utter, remember that their authority is just temporary. And this was, it wasn't, Kevin, didn't he mention that in his sermon, right? That the word temporary changes so much when it comes to suffering. At the end of the day, if we can have that mentality that the worst you can do to me is take my life and then just usher me into heaven, that changes the way we interact with the government. It changes the way we interact with our, with our neighbor who might also be our enemy. It changes the way that we interact in the sense of giving us courage and boldness. Peter reminds the believers, yeah, they might slander you, they might hurt you, they might make you suffer, but one day they're going to stand and give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel is also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. Two things. Notice the... the Irony is not the right word. Notice the the reversal of Jesus, the one who suffered, right? The one who Peter has already said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Notice the reversal of the suffering king then becoming the king in judgment, right? That becomes the comfort for believers. Our king suffered, he rose again, and he sits now and will sit in judgment over the world. So there's that reversal. That's the first thing. The second thing is, okay, well, what does he mean that he proclaimed the gospel to those who are dead? Okay, well, let's talk about this. We always end with the fun stuff, right? <laughs> we may not get further than this. Hopefully we will, but we'll see. What does it mean? Well, some, some argue that this was Jesus going and proclaiming himself to people who lived before the coming of Jesus, 
and therefore had no chance to know who Jesus was, had no chance to respond to the gospel, that basically God was holding those who died before Jesus came. He was holding them all kind of collectively and giving them an opportunity in this moment for a post-mortem salvation decision. So that's one position. If so, this would be the only time in the scriptures, arguably, that a post-mortem salvation possibility is ever presented. Um, and in, on this view, Jesus went, he proclaimed himself, some believed in him, so he proclaims himself, he proclaims the gospel to those who are dead, so that even though they died according to the fleshly standards, now they can live according to God's standards, okay? That's one theory. There are some pretty big problems with that, right? Namely, that the book of Hebrews says it's appointed for man once to die and after that to face judgment. So any view of a post-mortem possibility of following Christ has some really big challenges. That's just one scriptural thing. There's other kind of uh, really thorny issues with that as well. I'm going to take a simpler approach. This is what I think it's saying. I think it's talking about those in the Old Testament who had died, but who had died in faith and who did not know the full identity of Jesus, but when Jesus died, he proclaimed the gospel, in other words, proclaimed the fullness of the gospel, so that in that moment, those who had died in faith had and were given a full awareness of the big picture at that moment. In other words, and, and this gets to why, like the way that death is described in the Old Testament, death is described in the Old Testament, uh, the idea of heaven and hell has not been fully revealed at that point, but what is the... the the place of death in the Old Testament is referred to as Sheol, right? And if you read like Ecclesiastes, you read the Psalms, they talk about Sheol really pretty often. You know, even in the book of Genesis, Jacob says, my, my gray hair is going to go to bed in Sheol. And here's, here, here seems to be the Old Testament belief about Sheol. They seem to believe that it was a holding place for both the righteous and the wicked, and how do we know that? It talks about in Ecclesiastes. Whether you're righteous or you're wicked, we all end up in the same place, in this Sheol place. So then really, what, what's there any good in being good? Author of Ecclesiastes talks about this. Well, as the Old Testament progresses, God continues to reveal a little bit more. So that by the time you get, by the way, to like the book of Daniel, you read the end of the book of Daniel and you have these hints and statements about the resurrection. Some argue, by the way, that even in Job, that Job talks about resurrection. That's really interesting. We don't have time to get into all that, but here's my point. You have this belief in the Old Testament that there is one holding place for everyone. With that idea, if that's true, then what Peter is meaning is that in the moment of his death, Jesus went to all of the saints of old who were being held in Sheol in a kind of t temporary area and Jesus proclaimed who he was. In other words, I'm the Messiah who you've been waiting for. I'm the one who was prophesied to come. I'm the sinless son of God who has come and redeemed you through my death. And in proclaiming the gospel, took those who were dead in faith to heaven with him in victory to live with him and be with him forever. Um, that's actually what I think is the best interpretation. Now, that creates some... some tension in people's mind. Well, what do you mean? Did people in the Old Testament not die and immediately go to heaven? What do we do with passages like Abraham's bosom what, or, or the death of Lazarus? But think about this. I actually think uh, that actually helps to prove what I'm saying. The parable that Jesus told, right, of the rich man and Lazarus, of course, some people argue that's not a parable. I'm just going to say it's a parable, okay? It doesn't say that, the, that Lazarus died and immediately went to heaven, it said he went to Abraham's bosom. And when you read it, it says that he sat with Abraham, he dined with Abraham, there were angels who attended him, but notice it doesn't, it, it, you don't quite get the same picture, right, in Jesus' parable with Lazarus and, and the rich man. You don't quite get the same picture as you get in, say, Revelation 4 and 5, where you see all the creatures around the throne and you see the saints worshiping. It doesn't seem to be quite the same setup. Why? Well, because the Old Testament doesn't quite get us to a heaven where Jesus sits enthroned. And here's why, because Jesus hadn't come yet. In other words, I think what Peter is saying here is that the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus was not just an event that fundamentally changed the earthly reality. I actually think he is arguing that it's an event that changed the spiritual realities as well. 
that even those who are dead before Christ, and we talked about this a little bit last week, I don't think that they were automatically downloaded with the full picture. I think that they literally were waiting for the full picture of the gospel to come when Jesus came. So again, I'm just going to read it, and, and we'll see if that makes sense of it, right? For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. I think what Peter's saying there is that in his death, Jesus literally proclaimed the victory over death and ushered in a new era of heaven where all the Old Testament saints of old became aware in that moment that even though my faith may have been in the promise to come, actually my faith was in the promised one to come, Jesus himself. Um, yeah. And that's where, again, that gets into all kinds of questions. Of, okay, well, then, uh, I don't know. I, I won't say what questions. I'll ask you. What questions, what questions do you have? Feel free to disagree with me. That is, again, these are things that are hard, right? I mean, uh, would I lie on a bed of nails saying that I believe that's true? Probably not, you know? Um, but in terms of this passage, I think that's a lot better alternative than Jesus went and proclaimed a second opportunity for people who had already passed away. Um, I think that's probably the best of the options we have. But any thoughts about that? Any questions? I'm sure that, yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and so if you didn't hear Lance, Lance said, even in the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the most ancient creeds that we have, uh, and of course, when we speak of creeds, a lot of times we as Baptists sort of like, hey, we don't really like creeds. Um, I, think, uh, I think that's unnecessary. Creeds are not the Bible. And here's what some people argue. When you talk about creeds, you're elevating creeds to the level of Scripture. I don't think that's true. We have confessions. They're a little bit different. But here's the bottom line. There's a very old statement of faith, if that language works better for you, uh, from the early church that's been around for literally 1800 years that Christians have affirmed as a right reading of the scriptures. Part of the Apostles' Creed is Jesus descended into hell. We talked about this a little bit last week, right? Uh, what does that mean? What does it mean that he descended into hell? Some people, I think, very wrongly argue that descended into hell means that Jesus went and had a boxing match with Satan in Satan's home territory, right? That, and, you know, that Satan is the ruler of hell and that Jesus in his death literally went to hell and wrestled, you know, the keys of hell away from Satan. Like there was, and, and no, that, um, that's not true. Why? For many reasons. There's never any indication that, that you have a yin-yang in the scriptures where evil is just as powerful as good. That's not true. Another problem with that is that literally the Bible says that Satan entered into Judas and, and basically use Judas as a means by which to bring about the crucifixion. If you've been following the way, we're in 1 Corinthians, the passage in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about the idea that if the rulers would have known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Many people argue that the word that he uses for rulers actually refers to angelic powers. So there's many problems with that idea, that the idea that Jesus descending into hell means that he fought and defeated the powers of darkness in a literal battle. What I think is a better interpretation is that his death itself was the victory, and I would, I would interpret hell in the Apostles' Creed not as hell as in the final place of judgment for the Satan, Satan and his angels, but rather hell in a more sheol sense, the abode of the dead, where those souls that were kept waiting for that victory were held, so that then when Jesus came, he proclaimed, he, this is what I'm saying, Jesus proclaimed, your redemption has been bought. I am the one you have been waiting for. And I, I don't have any problem thinking that those people, when they died, and I, I don't have any problem thinking that they waited for that moment. And here's why. We have indications, even in the Old Testament, of what happened to people when they died. Uh, and they're, they're hazy, but real. Here's one. Witch of Endor, 
end of Saul's life, Saul knows that God's hand has turned against him. It's this really crazy story. Someone will have to look up exactly where it is. Uh, some, I think it's somewhere at the end of 1 Samuel, something like that. Um, Saul doesn't want to consult God because he knows God's hand is against him. So he finds the witch of Endor. Sounds like Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? Yeah. No. Witch of Endor. And she is a necromancer. She speaks to the dead. And she literally, uh, he, he goes to her and he says, okay, I need a word from God, but I can't go to God directly. So I need you to conjure back up, uh, I need you to conjure back up um, Samuel for me. I need a word from Samuel. And so she says, okay, I'll bring Samuel back up. And so what does it say? It says that she conjures Samuel up and he looks like an old man who's wrapped in a robe. So, well, what does that mean? How, like, like literally, this is funny. Listen, I've talked about this before. What does that mean? Did he look into the ground and see like a misty robe floating up in an old man? Like, was it a crystal ball? Was it, and some people argue, by the way, that the witch, she cries out, it says. So some people argue that the witch was like, oh, I've never actually done this before. This is new to me that it actually worked. In other words, they would say necromancy is not really a deal that God just allowed to happen. Again, lots of debate about that. But the point is, it seems like, because what does Samuel say? When Samuel comes up, he says, why have you disturbed my peace? In other words, if we read that even close to literally, it seems like there was a restful peace that Samuel was in that wasn't heaven as we know it, but was a peaceful rest anticipating something to come. By the way, another example of this would be the language used in the Old Testament, and I believe it's a euphemism. I don't know that we can take it straight literally, but what does it say when people died? Kings, when they died, it says they were buried and they rested with their fathers. So you have this sense that when people died in the Old Testament, there was rest. It was a spiritual rest. It was real, but it wasn't necessarily the full experience of heaven. Bottom line is, I think that's the best way to read the Apostles' Creed. That Jesus descended into hell, meaning the resting place for, for people before Jesus came, and he proclaimed the gospel to them, not in a fight, not in a battle, but he proclaimed, it is finished, right? He, go back to this. It would make no see, sense for Jesus to say, it is finished, die, and then go fight a battle in hell, right? If you hear someone say that, go the other way, right? All right, that's enough. Any other questions? There's, this is interesting stuff. It is. Uh, Yeah, I, I, I think if I'm understanding what you're saying that I'm in basic agreement to that. And that's actually an interesting point. Because by the time you get to Hebrews chapter 12, which is the passage that talks about the great cloud of witnesses, by the time you get there, the author of Hebrews says, fix your, you know, therefore, since you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and who are the witnesses? Well, he tells us in Hebrews 11, it's all these Old Testament saints. By the time you get to Hebrews 12, the author is saying, they're there, they're in heaven, and, and it's a metaphor how far you stretch it, but man, they, they're cheering for you. Like they've completed their race, they've gone through it, they've been faithful, but therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the author of Hebrews seems to be saying that the Old Testament saints are cheering us on in some way. Well, of course, for that to happen, they would have had to have been transferred from whatever, wherever they were holding. Jesus comes in victory. They ascend to heaven with him. And now all of a sudden, they're the cheerleaders for those of us who are going through on earth. Hold on. It's going to be okay. Think of what I've been through, Abraham might say. Or think of what I've, I've seen, Daniel might say, or whatever. So yeah, I, I, if I understand that correctly, I'm really in basic agreement with that. 
I will say, I think most of us probably have an unspoken assumption in our minds that the way that the New Testament describes things in terms of spiritual reality is the way that they always were. And that's something that I think we can at least call into question. What does the New Testament say now? The New Testament says now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when we die, if we die in Christ, I believe that we are immediately spiritually ushered into the presence of Christ. And that we await in his presence until the time of the resurrection when he comes and raises the dead. Then we receive our permanent resurrection bodies. And then heaven and earth will once again be one and will be forever with the Lord. That's what I think happens now. But I think that could only be possible on the other side of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Right? That that was the event that the Old Testament saints were looking forward to. And that's the event that also, how does, how does Paul describe Jesus? As the firstborn among the dead. He's the firstborn of the resurrection. We will also receive resurrection bodies when he returns. That's how I would understand it. Other thoughts? Psalms 82, tell me. I, I don't know it off the top of my head. So you mean... Uh, is that the one that talks about sons of God? Yeah, so God judges among the gods. So this kind of gets to what we were talking about a little bit last week with angelic presence. <laughs> What's my rule? Don't say something new. I've got 50 seconds, so... Uh, yeah. The, sorry, Grace, go ahead. Are you saving me from this right here? Yeah. The answer to that is no. I don't think that's the case. Here's, here's the, I'll, I'll answer that because it's a lot easier question. Um, here's, here's the thing with Greek and Hebrew. Greek and Hebrew are great. They're helpful. I had a professor say this one time. He said, Reading Greek and Hebrew is very important. It's worth all the effort that it takes to do it. But at the end of the day, it's, he, he described it as the difference between watching something on black and white TV versus watching full color HD. It's really the same picture. You're going to be able to see some things differently, more clearly, but fundamentally it's the same. So when it comes to Greek and Hebrew, are they helpful? Very. And anyone who has the opportunity to study them and learn them, do it. It's worth it. You will never, and this is how you, oh, I'm not, it's worth it. But no, our translations are really very good. They really are. Um, and we've had very good translations for a very long time. So very few things are only, uh, are, are matters of translation. Now, in answer to that question, Psalm 82 might be the exception to what I just said. Because the passage that Lance talked about in Psalm 82 is Here's what it says, God stands in the divine assembly, he pronounces judgment among the gods. And the Hebrew word there is Elohim. Okay, so we know the Hebrew word, Elohim can be the name of God. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That can be God singular, as in God most high. It can also be gods, as in generic gods. So the gods of the nations are also referred to as Elohim, little g-gods. The translation matters, but honestly, I just explained it to you. In, in 30 seconds, you understand the Hebrew. That's why learning Hebrew is helpful, but you can understand it even if you can't read Hebrew. Okay, the word is Elohim. What does Elohim mean? Some argue that the word Elohim can at times refer to humans, and it can. Sometimes human rulers are referred to as Elohim. So in answer to your question, there's at least a debate that the gods, quote-unquote, in Psalm 82 actually aren't what we would call divine beings, but maybe they're mighty rulers uh, who are human that refer to themselves as gods. But here's kind of the basic answer. I'll, I'll do a 30 second version. In the Old Testament, there was an understanding that God had a divine council that consisted of angelic beings that he ruled over and allowed to participate and help in his rule. We know the names of two of them, Gabriel and Michael, right? This is something that, again, most people don't think about, but the Old Testament's pretty clear. God rules, God reigns, God is, uh, you know, God is above all, God is God most high. 
but is there, in a sense, some kind of pantheon of angelic beings who help God administer his rule and reign in the world? The answer to that is yes. We see that in the book of Job. We see it in other places. It's mysterious. Some people like to talk about it a lot. We can talk about it next week uh, as well, but that's the basic answer to your question. There's, there's a translation issue, but I will say this. I'll just go back to graces because, again, it's easy, and I'll end with something just that. Most of the time, translations are not really going to fundamentally change interpretations. They won't. Feel confident in your English translations. Learn Greek and Hebrew if you ever have, ever have the chance. It's well worth it. But trust your translations. All right, we got to be done. We'll keep going next week, all right? If you have any other questions to think about or talk about, I'd love to.